Well, good morning. Uh, our speaker today is Joe Cressman. Uh, Joe and I spent uh, about a year, a few years ago, together, meeting at Dunkin' Donuts and uh, going through a book together. And, and, if, and if I was asked for uh, a list of men whom I have had the joy of seeing Christ formed in them over the years, Joe would be at the top of the list. And, uh, and I know you're going to be blessed as he shares a reflection from John 19 this morning. So if you have a Bible, I'm going to read the passage, and then I'll give you a few moments of quiet reflection, and then Joe will come and share with us. So we'll look at verses 28 through 37, and here's what it says. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood, blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. The word of the Lord. Just take a few moments. Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you on this Good Friday. I am just so grateful for this church. Great, <laughs> grateful for these services. And... I'm grateful for this passage and a chance to get to reflect on it together with you. Would you guys pray with me now as I get started? Lord Jesus, speak to us now through your word. Help my friends here to see past the man at the podium, a man of many weaknesses, and to see you, Jesus, a savior of perfect strength. Pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. And hear my pray. Amen. Ernest Renan, a 19th century philosopher, once said, All history is incomprehensible without Christ. Renan was not a Christian, and yet he recognized that Jesus is the central figure in all of human history. Our passage today illustrates how Christ makes sense of Israel's history, specifically its observance of the Passover. John is showing us that Jesus is the true and perfect Passover lamb. He is our lamb without blemish or spot. Yes. Notice how John's crucifixion account varies from those of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. For example, he leaves out what I would consider pretty important details, the temple veil being torn in half, the earthquake or the centurion's revelation that Jesus was in fact the Son of God. But I think John's goal here is to draw us back to the beginning of his gospel when John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's showing us how Jesus fulfilled that prophecy by suffering on the cross and how, in looking back on the first Passover, we would see that this was God's plan all along. I'd like to point out two ways that John is revealing this 
and then we'll consider a response together to this passage. So we see in verse 28 that Jesus' death is at hand. By now he has endured unimaginable suffering and is likely so exhausted and dehydrated that he can barely speak. Thus the words, I thirst. And John explains that this also fulfilled scripture, and perhaps he was thinking of Psalm 69, 21, where David writes, They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. In verse 29, John tells us that they bring Jesus the wine on a hyssop branch. And this is the detail I would like us to just sort of zero in for a moment, because while all the Gospels describe this moment, John is the only one to specifically mention the use of hyssop. So why was this important? Well, hyssop was what Moses instructed the Israelites to use to sprinkle blood over the doors of their homes during the first Passover. This is actually found in Exodus 12.21, and I'll read this. It says, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go, Select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. And this, of course, was to shield them from God's judgment on the Egyptians when the Lord struck down the firstborn of every household, but he passed over, that is, he spared the nation of Israel. So it appears that John's mention of hyssop was purposeful. William Barclay, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, agrees. He writes, The very mention of hyssop would take the thoughts of any Jew back to the saving blood of the Passover lamb. So it seems John was contrasting the beams of the cross with the door frames of the first Passover. You see, both were painted with blood, and in both cases a hyssop branch extended upward. In both cases, a sacrifice was made. In both cases, a Passover lamb was slain. And in both cases, this was to shield a people from God's righteous judgment on sin. Last week, my family and I were on vacation in Florida, and uh, our rental was just a few minutes' walk from the beach. And my son, Levi, he loves to swim, and this time around, he especially loves swimming in the ocean. So we decided to spend the last afternoon, he and I and my wife, uh, at the beach, even though it was probably the windiest day of the week. And uh, well, as soon as we got close, we could tell that the waves were much bigger than we had anticipated and than we had experienced prior in that week. But Levi was set on going in, so we started to kind of make our way out. I stayed very close to him. You could probably kind of guess what happened. No sooner than we were knee-deep, an enormous wave just kind of knocked us down and started to wash us up on shore like we were seaweed. (laughs) Friends, do you realize that we were once in the path of the tidal wave that is God's wrath towards sinners? The Bible says that we were, by our very nature, children of wrath. We needed a substitute. On the cross, Jesus absorbed all the punishment that our sins deserved. As our Passover lamb, only he can shield us from the judgment that is to come. Let's continue in verse 31. There we see the religious leaders come to Pilate and essentially ask him to finish off Jesus and the others by breaking their legs. They didn't want the bodies to remain on the cross because Jewish law required that those who suffered the death penalty be buried the same day. So the soldiers break the legs of the two criminals, but when they come to Jesus, they see he's already dead, and so they don't break his legs. But to make sure that he was, in fact, dead, one of them thrusts his spear into Jesus' side, and we have John's eyewitness testimony of blood and water flowing. In verses 36 and 37, John connects these events to two more Old Testament verses, Psalm 34, 20, He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. 
And then Zechariah 12.10, which says, When they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. Indeed, in Luke's gospel, we see that many onlookers, when they saw how Jesus died, they returned home beating their chests in mourning. I think there's a second way these verses reveal Christ as Passover lamb. To see this, we need to look at how God instructed the Israelites to prepare and then eat the Passover lamb. In Numbers 9.12, God says, They shall leave none of it until morning, nor break any of its bones. According to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. So just as the Israelites did not leave the body of the Passover lamb for the next day, so the body of Christ did not remain. And just as they were to consume the lamb without breaking its bones, so we, through faith, consume Christ, his body and blood poured out for us. And yet in God's providence, not one of his bones were broken. He is our perfect Passover lamb. Friends, these events show us that the events of Good Friday were planned long before evil men conspired to kill the Son of God. As Brother Jim Lowe reminded us earlier this week, ours was a willing Passover lamb. That's why John could say that on the cross, Jesus knew all things were finished. His mission, his very purpose of dying in the place of sinners like me and like you was complete. So what is our response? Well, first to those here who may not be a Christian, I realize that this may sound a bit strange, talking about sacrifices and blood and some weird plant. I just want you to know how much God loves you. You know, today the word love kind of gets thrown around quite easily, but God has demonstrated his love for us in this way. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. On the cross, Jesus bore the punishment that you and I deserved so that we could be forgiven and made right with God. In John 10, Jesus said he came so that we might have life and have it abundantly. If you want to know more about this abundant life that Jesus offers, come talk to me or perhaps one of the pastors or the person that brought you to church. For my Christian brothers and sisters, I'd like us to go back in our passage to verse 30 and consider Jesus' final words on the cross. In that verse, it says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. Three simple words, and yet the significance of those words possibly makes this the most important verse in all of Scripture. And my question for us is this. Does our salvation rest on anything other than what Jesus accomplished on the cross? The answer is no, and yet I think we can sometimes fall into a habit of living as if Christ's sacrifice was not enough. I'm sure most of us, if asked, would say, no, salvation is not of works, but of grace through faith alone. And yet, do we act differently sometimes? Do we sort of keep a mental checklist of of everything that we do for the Lord, kind of like a, a spiritual resume, you know, ready to go, just in case. 2,000 years ago, the Son of God said, it is finished. That means our salvation was won long before any of us would join a church or lead a small group or volunteer in a nursery or serve on a security team, which are all good things, But none of them can save you. None of them will make you or me any more acceptable before a holy God. Only Christ can do this. And it's so critical that we get this because if our salvation rests on anything other than Christ's work on the cross, we are on shaky ground. Jesus said that on the last day, many will call him Lord. And many will say, look, Lord, I did this, I did this. And his response to many will be, depart from me, I never knew you. I take it these will be people that wanted to look the part, but never actually wanted Jesus. 
I'm thankful to know so many of you and to have seen your love for the Savior. So I ask again, does our salvation rest on anything other than what Christ accomplished on the cross? Friends, may our assurance be found in nothing and no one else but Christ, our perfect Passover lamb, in whose blood we have redemption, forgiveness of sins, and whom alone can say, it is finished. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your sacrifice and what that means for us. We pray that we would look to nothing and to no one but to you this morning for salvation, for our forgiveness. I pray that you would bless my friends as they go from here, that they would carry those thoughts with them, that you are our perfect Passover lamb, and that you've done everything for us. Amen.